Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Perconti. I'm the director of the Army Research Laboratory, and welcome to ARL, What We Learned Today. This is a podcast where we talk with Army scientists and engineers about the science and technology that will modernize the United States Army and make our soldiers stronger and safer. Today, we're going to talk with Dr. Konstantinos Mitsingas. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah, Dino for short. Dino is a mechanical engineer in our vehicle technology directorate, and he's working on propulsion. So, Dino, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So, Dino, how long have you been at ARL? Since 10th of December last year. Oh, so you're here, you're a newbie. Yes. Where'd you go to school? Uh, University of Illinois, Urbana. Oh, it's a great school. Yeah. So what'd you study there? Uh, I did mechanical engineering, and my uh, PhD thesis focused on laser diagnostics in highly turbulent flows. So like uh, scramjet or gas turbine. You know about hypervelocity things. Uh, yeah, yeah, hypersonic flows. Hypersonics, also, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Flows, though, mostly. I focus, like I said, in predominantly gas turbines and some other geometry combustors. And the uh, main idea was how we could utilize uh, lasers to do a non-intrusive uh, tracking of radicals or combustion-important species. So would you consider yourself a, a laser guy? I would consider myself more of a laser guy. Okay, yes. so you're on the you're on the photonics end more so than the yes. Yeah. So so what are you working on now? So right now I'm working under uh, one of the uh, essential research programs, and that's the the Victor, which is the the versatile tactical power and propulsion, and the subset of that, which is in uh, the development of the multi fuel capable uh, hybrid electric uh, propulsion system. So in, the, in that particular aspect, I'm working on uh, doing laser diagnostics again in uh, high-pressure temperature vessels or other engine environments to determine how well different uh, cetane number fuels, and cetane number is essentially the ignition quality that a fuel has, uh, work well. So what's the difference between a cetane and an octane? So octane, I think, is more for gasoline, right? So it, it, you normally want to always see uh, both of them. You want both a high octane and a high cetane number. And cetane is just a an empirical formulation of all the properties that the fuel has. Uh, and it's, it's a similar test, though, to... So I'm going to tax my knowledge of fuel. So we have JP8 yes. and we have JB5. Which is a better fuel? Uh, so JP8 is normally the better fuel, which I, I guess in the Army we also have it called as F24. It's the same thing as JP8? Yeah, it's, clo- it's, it's very close. It's just probably a, a, sim- a slightly different additive package. We, we had to change the name because we're Army and we don't have jets or what? Uh, so I'm not 100% sure about that, <laughs> but that's a very good question. Uh, so, so which has a higher C-tank? So J- JP5 will have, but even, even within the JP5, depending on which uh, distillery it came from, the c number can vary. We take a JP5, which has almost every other uh, property virtually the same, like, you know, viscosity and its density and everything else, but its CT number is different. And we're trying to see how that now uh, affects our engines. So is CT, so do you think uh, you can make or or develop an engine that is flexible to CT? Is that the goal? Yes. The the idea is uh, since uh, CT number seems to be predominantly a good... uh, empirical formulation of how well a fuel will burn in an engine, uh, and we haven't found anything better right now, but we're also trying to work in other technologies to see, is there a better way of detecting a different fuel property that will help us help tell us in line in the field, I'm putting this random fuel in, what is that fuel, and then optimize my engine so it runs on that fuel, right? So, but the main goal is that, is to develop an, uh, at least an engine or a, a way that we can control the engine or change the controls to fit the particular fuel that is being put in the engine without the soldier caring what fuel he's putting in the engine. Right, so any they could scavenge any fuel on the battlefield? So and in the end, yes. The, the, the far goal is to scavenge, uh, you know, even put whatever fuel or alcohols, like go down to your, uh, you know, drugstore, huh. buy some vodka, pour it in the engine, and it will be able to run. That would be interesting, where we would actually pour the vodka. Would it be into the engine or into somebody... Mouth. <laughs> yeah. You can do both, right? It's like, it's al- like cooking. <laughs> but alcohol is a, a very clean burning fuel, right? Isn't it? Um... Yeah. So there, it's also the problem with alcohol is that it's a very low cetane number ah, fuel. There you go. So, yeah. Okay. So that's the, the low end. That's the problem. One of the, one of the fuels that we're looking at is uh, alcohol derived jet fuels. Okay. Right? The alcohol to jet fuel process. And that has a cetane number in the 15 to 20 range, which is low compared to JPA, which is like in the 45, 50 range, depending oh, in. So what, what's the, what would be the highest 
fuel? What, what what fuel would have the highest cetane number? The one that I've I've seen is JPA that we use that's right the now. Highest. Yeah. The JPA is full of sulfur, right? So that is, uh, yeah, that's another big problem is you have to desulfur uh, a lot of these fuels before you put them in the engines. So is that a, would that be a problem on the battlefield? Uh, well, sulfur, yes. But that means that uh, that would be a separate issue to the engine, right? So we would have to have a separate unit that would you put in whatever. It takes all the sulfur out and then so puts it in the engine. So you'd have to do that least. first. Yes, unless... It's a dirty little secret. Yeah, but... But, you know, I can always envision an engine that would be able to take in and be more resistant to the sulfur effects. But that's not as near term as what we're thinking. What we're thinking is at least developing uh, within the next, like, five to ten years an engine that can burn cetane 15 to cetane 50. That's great. Yeah. And uh, in the future, we could have, like, a Mr. Fusion type device, right, <laughs> that you just take whatever you want, garbage, throw it in, and it runs. But that's like maybe in like 50, 60 years. Okay, well, we'll that's good. That's a good goal to get to, right? Of course. So your your technology, your research is directly applicable to uh, yes. what the Army needs, you think? Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm doing more of the fundamental type research mm -hmm. right now. So one of the aspects that I'm focusing on is, like I said, taking these fuels, we run them through the engine. Uh, we run them through uh, our, our temperature and high temperature vessels or engine vessels and uh, we shine lasers at them, and then we observe the radicals that are important in combustion, and then we're able to quantify what's the uh, ignition uh, quality, how well does it ignite, when does it ignite, and then the idea is to take all these values and create a, a map or a model that we'd be able to use and be like, okay, this is the model that our engine will use. So then once we are able to detect what fuel we use, we'll, we'll be able to run anything. Yeah, but even though your research is fundamental, I think these are very, these are burning, pardon the pun, burning open questions, right, about uh, of course. What, what has to be done to, to bring any fuel to the battlefield field and make it useful for the Army. So, yes, yes. I so. mean, it will, it will definitely reduce the resupply logistical issue that exists. You right. need... So there's a real connection to fundamental research mm -hmm. and new capability for the Army. These are these open questions that we have uh, articulated in our essential research programs, right? Yes. So for you, I'm sure there is a burning open question in the ERP mm -hmm. that uh, Mike Kwan, the, the program manager for the ERP, is asking you to solve, right? What is it? The primary question is to figure out, okay, what are appropriate controls and configurations of an engine that would allow it to burn all these different fuels? So within that subset, that means now we have to figure out how does each fuel burn, uh -huh. right? Uh, what are the differences between the fuels? And then obviously we started with a narrow subrange, right? We're, we're targeting the 15 to 50 CT number uh, because once, once we learn how that works, then we can start expanding that range to all, all sorts of other fuels. Very good. Did you do any postdoc here? Or? Uh, so I did not do a postdoc. I, uh, I was under the Pathways program. Oh, okay. Yeah, Very so good. once my... Talk uh, a little bit about that, so just so people know what the Pathways program is. So, so the Pathways program is a, is a very good opportunity that the Army provides where uh, they pick up a student or they work with a student and they sponsor, they give the stipend to the student as well as the tuition waiver uh, with the university. And then I'm able to work as a, as a federal employee, actually, under the Pathways program uh, part-time throughout my uh, PhD career. I, I actually joined... Uh, at 2010 as a contractor first, so hired through the university. And then I was converted through all the different programs. That was, it was STEP first, then it was converted to something else from Oak Ridge, and then it was made into the Pathways Polar Program. The biggest advantage, though, is, is that after, the, after your, you finish your, uh, your schooling, uh, then you can get converted to a full-time employee, which you can elect to do that if you want to. Right, right. Well, I think that's a great deal for anybody. So. For sure. It's wonderful, and particularly if it aligns with what you want to do, the research you want to do, and the career path you want to take. So that, that's awesome. So you like what you're doing? Of course. Excited who, by what you're doing? Who wouldn't like to shoot lasers and flames, yeah, right? I'll tell like, you what, man. There's nothing like science. <laughs> Too yes. much fun. Exactly. Have, you, have you had a chance to talk to any soldiers? Uh, so uh, the only soldier I've interacted with is Colonel Ryan. Colonel Ryan. Which we had the three-minute thesis that we did oh, last you week. Oh, yeah, yeah, so I'm doing okay. that next week also. Yeah, so yeah, we... yeah. That sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was really fun. He actually gave us very, very good comments. He, he, he prepped you? He gave you feedback already? Yeah, yeah. He, well, it was, it was more like uh, 
he's like, what do you think about that? And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's an application that I hadn't thought about that, that might not be, again, it might be a long term, you know, into 30 years into the future, but that would be a very interesting thing to do. Yeah. So we're hitting on a few things that people probably don't know about that, that, that most people may not know about um, pathways. Mm-hmm. And the three minute thesis is something we just started. Yes. So can you tell Tell us a little bit about what it is. So the, the three-minute thesis started in more of the uh, collegiate level as a competition between students to present their research to a panel of people, and then they're great. It's, it's almost like an elevator pitch, uh, just a longer elevator pitch. So what we're doing here is we're doing something similar with our researchers in the different departments, and we're going to have a competition which is going to be judged by the uh, soldiers to determine... I guess, uh, which uh, research or how the research is presented they like more or, or which programs. Yeah, so, and also we're going to give out prizes. So uh, under my director's initiative, we're going to give $50,000 to the first place, I guess. Uh, I think it's twenty five k for the second and fifteen k for the third. And those prizes you can use to support your ongoing research. It's not, it doesn't have to be for new research. It can be for whatever so, um, anything you want to ask me? Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's a great opportunity talking with you. Like I said, I, I didn't think that would happen within six months of starting. So, like, the main thing that I like about the Army predominantly, and I don't know if that's a question or more like what I'm realizing is, uh, uh, as a student, our, our research is very, very, very fundamental. And uh, that means that normally we're not going to see an effect of what we do in, like, unless someone else takes it and makes an application or it's like 100 years in the future. Uh, what I've liked from what I've seen here is I've had the opportunity to work on projects that have an effect in the five-year f- term, but also in the like 30 to 40-year term. So, so you get the, the best of both worlds. Right. And, and, and that's, uh, is that something, I guess, that you plan for? Well, yeah, well, or? here's the thing. So people, I think m- many people in your position feel similarly, right? Um, you know, my research is long term. How how can I ever achieve what you're asking from a an army point of view, from a capability point of view? Uh, and you're also asking us to do to look in the near term. And there's something of a tension between near and far. So and it's a bit confusing to people, right? So so how do you deconflict that? Well, well, here's what I say. So yes, your research is long term. Ultimately, it will take many many years for the things you're you've described to actually be fielded. But the things you learn today, the open questions that you answer today, are extraordinarily valuable today because they're helping set the stage for the Army for the future. So the Army, right now, we're in the middle of this thing called multi-domain operations, which is the new Army warfighting concept. And what the soldiers are doing is they're trying to figure out what technology, what capability, will be available in the future, and then how to actually use those things to deter war and if we have to go to war to be successful. Those questions are all open science questions. So the things you answer today, like is it really feasible based on what we know today about CETAIN and JP8 and the ability to remove the sulfur, is it really feasible to have an engine sometime in the future that can be multi-fuel capable? And not to just be a futurist about it, but to actually be scientifically driven to the answer. And if we say, we think so, based on our research, and we think so today, that that will occur, that's a contribution you're making right now, because it will affect the the entire future of the Army. That's extraordinarily important. The other thing is, as you do your experiments and you think about new ideas and new technology and maybe something that is near term, you should... You should say, hey, you should come and, tell, come and tell me, hey, Dr. Pryor, we got this thing. We think we can get out of here, get it out of the laboratory and get it to a company or get it somewhere else in the near term. It's not something you're going to do because you're not going to do the engineering. But maybe we, we could take this idea, partner with an engineering group and get it out sooner. I'm a big supporter of that. So that wouldn't necessarily be you, but it would be your idea, your intellectual property that we would take out of the laboratory really, really quickly. So that's the intent. Is It's not so much to drive our staff to the, to the near term, but it's to get us to think about how we can take what we do today and, and make it consumable for people who need it 
either in ideas or perhaps even in technology. But again, we would put the engineering wrapper around that. That's I view that as one of my jobs is to figure out how to take the science and the ideas that are coming out of the laboratories and get the engineering around it so we can get it accelerated. So that's that's the goal. Yeah, and that's a, a very nice thing, especially since I'm learning now is uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, cooperative agreements with companies because we're trying to figure out is like we have some technologies that, um, like you mentioned, we're, we're, we're validating and verifying this is theoretically possible and is done in the lab scale. Now, is there anyone out there that would like to take this and make it into a consumable product? And I think that's a, that's a really nice way to work, at least, because you can concurrently now be working on, we have these components being worked by the company, developing it as a consumable, while we're improving the technology and theoretical background behind it. Exactly. You got it, Dino. It was really a pleasure Likewise. to meet you. At some point, you can bring the Uzo. I'll bring the Anazette. We'll see which one we like better. Uh, and, um, you know, I wish you the best of luck in, uh, in what you do. Thank Joining you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, thanks for joining us for ARL, What We Learned Today. In upcoming episodes, we'll continue the discussion about the underpinning research that will build the Army of the future. Please consider listening, liking, and subscribing. For the Army Research Lab, I'm Dr. Phil Percanti. Thanks for listening. Thank you.